10,000 times 10,000 in sparkling raiment bright. The armies of the ransom saints from up the steeps of light. Is finished, all is finished, the fight with death and sin. Fling open wide the golden gates and let the victors in. What rush of hallelujahs fill all the earth and sky. What ringing of a thousand harps he speaks the triumph night. O day for which creation and all its tribes were made. O joy for all its former was a thousand full great pain. Oh, then what raptured greetings on Canaan's happy shore, what knit and severed friendships of were partings on no more. Then eyes with joy shall sparkle, that brim with tears of late. Orphans no longer fatherless, nor widows desolate. Bring near thy great salvation, the Lamb for sinners slain. Fill up the realm of thine elect, then take thy power and reign. Appear desire of nations, thine exiles long for home. Show in the heavens thy promised sign, the Prince and Saviour come. Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> And I hope my voice does not go out entirely this evening. But let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 6. And we are looking tonight at a very important portion of Scripture. Pagans will cheat to win. I think most of us know that, uh, just sort of automatically, pagans will cheat to win. Within this past week, uh, I have come across someone who is a very upstanding citizen. Uh, someone who is highly thought of in a certain community uh, around this area here, uh, someone who is fairly wealthy, someone who is um, religious, though not of a faith that leads to heaven, uh, and yet someone who cheerfully and happily told me directly to my faith, face that he is, in fact, cheating on something so that he can give out Christmas gifts. A wonderful objective, but a very bad way of doing it. Pagans do cheat to win, and pagans do all kinds of other things too that are not honest, simply because they have, <clears throat> as this particular individual told me, gotten away with it for the past 23 years. <laughs> well, folks, there are many who think that he is a wonderful person because of the particular gifts that he gives to them. But just remember... That is not the way that Christians are supposed to be. Now we're in Acts chapter 6, and last time together we looked at apologetics, power, and persecution in verses 8 through 10. I just read that because that's the background for what we have going for us tonight. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now, of course, we all remember who Stephen was. He was the very first deacon listed for us in verse 5. He, in fact, is the only one that was chosen and then given a description. All the rest are merely listed. But we are told of Stephen that he was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And so as we are moving here into this portion of the text and then as we move into chapter 7... We find that Stephen is the key man. And we find that Satan always attacks the key man. If 
you can smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. If you can attack the key man and get him out of the way, then it's easier to reach those uh, who have been under him. And as we noted last week, servants of Christ who are making a great impact will always come under fire. At some time or another, if you are effective in your Christian life, you in fact will come under fire. Because unbelievers tend to gang up on effective Christians. Five different groups are mentioned here. And we noted last week that two of those in particular have a continuing impact later on in the uh, book of Acts, the Libertines, these Jewish slaves who had been freed from different parts of the Roman Empire. And it says, and those of Cilicia, the capital of Cilicia was Tarsus. And we learn later in the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul, who was then Saul, was from Tarsus. No doubt he was one of these who here, because he later tells us he stood by as they stoned Stephen, he was one of those who had been disputing with Stephen and he could not resist the wisdom of the Spirit by which Stephen spake. We find that the power that is mentioned here is the miraculous power of the apostolic age. Stephen is able to perform these miracles and that power is no longer available today because this is the first generation of believers. This is the period of time in which the scriptures were still being written and the supernatural sign gifts, the seven sign gifts that are listed for us in scripture were still being given. But once with the completion of the scripture, these gifts are no longer being given. And we noted the difference between miracles and healing. Healing is making people well and miracles is sometimes making people sick as we see in Acts chapter 13 where Paul strikes Elymas the sorcerer uh, with blindness. That's a miracle. It was not a healing. The second thing that we saw in this passage was that uh, wisdom is what he spoke with. He had wisdom. And we've noted the distinction between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to apply the facts to real life. And when we're talking about biblical knowledge and biblical wisdom, we're talking about the accumulation of a knowledge of the Word of God. And then wisdom is the divinely understood scripture as applied to real life. And we can all pray for wisdom. James tells us that in James chapter 1. In fact, we have to pray for it in faith, otherwise we have nothing. And we saw last week that wisdom is mentioned 234 times in the Bible in 222 verses. It's a rather important thing in the Word of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And so the two things that Stephen had for the qualifications of a deacon in verse 3, full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom, are the very things that we see being used here in this passage to refute those who have stood against the message of Christ. Never appoint church leaders who are not full of wisdom and full of the Holy Ghost. That means they have a, an articulate knowledge and ability to express the Word of God. They are people who are walking in the Spirit and not walking in the flesh. They are people who are walking by faith and who are moving forward with the truth regardless of the consequences. That's the kind of man that we see here with Stephen in this passage. Too many times we simply appoint people because they happen to be there, they happen to be available, even though they are not in fact qualified. We saw in our past study 17 qualifications for deacons, and we saw 22 qualifications for elders. Very important because those are God's qualifications, those are not our qualifications. And when we decide to put someone in an office who is not qualified, we are in fact disobeying the divine, almighty word of God and the spoken word of God and God himself. Very serious business for a church to do that, and a church will experience consequences when it does that kind of a thing. And so now tonight, we have pagans will cheat to win. And we go on from verse nine and it's, uh, uh, verse 10, and it says, They were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. 
For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I think Stephen probably even at this moment knew that he was about to die. He was a man who was unafraid. He was a man who was able to face death with quietness and with confidence. He was a man who was looking into heaven already and reflecting the glory of his Savior. The words that he speaks in chapter 7 are not bitter words. The words that he speaks are true words as he traces the history of the nation of Israel. The words that he speaks are direct words that pull no punches, for he is preaching to men who are lost and who need Christ. And years later, one of those men will come to Christ and become the greatest witness in the New Testament book of Acts. Sometimes it is a costly seed that is planted to bring forth a fruit that will have the greatest impact. Stephen will be the seed that is planted. A godly man. A man who lives by faith. And yet it is through that death experience of Stephen and as Paul reflects on it in Acts chapter 9 and as he is called by the Lord Jesus, he becomes the one who carries the mantle. It's interesting, we see Peter in the first half of the book of Acts and he fades out. And then we see Paul in the last half of the book of Acts doing all the same miracles that Peter did. And the one who carries on with the writing of most of the New Testament. Many times we feel that we are giving too great a sacrifice, but if it is a sacrifice for Christ, it will have eternal repercussions and reverberations. And so as we look at this situation, Stephen, standing before the council, they see something different about his face. The Word of God has a great deal to say about your countenance. What is it that others see in you? Are they attracted to something else besides your countenance? Are they attracted to your knowledge? Are they attracted to your physical beauty? Are they attracted to your peculiar mannerisms? Do you radiate Christ through your countenance? Oh, how we try to develop all of those other things. We want people to be attracted to our wealth. We want people to be attracted to our abilities. And in our culture, we want people to be attracted because we are beautiful people. Are they attracted to the radiance of Christ? in your countenance. We look at these verses and we see the stages of a battle are given to us in the verses. And there are many illustrations of this. We'll give you a few of them throughout Scripture. But we see the same type of stages of the battle as it begins to develop. First, we discover that an effective ministry will raise the enemy. And I'm not speaking merely of human enemies. It will raise the enemy, the enemy of our souls, Satan and his demonic host. Their goal is warfare against God, and you see that in the hymn that we sang first tonight. It will raise the enemy. As long as you are ineffective, they ignore you. As long as you are basically doing nothing for Christ, they ignore you. But the minute there becomes a reverberation out there in the world around and people become 
either convicted of their sins or drawn to Christ or some other spiritual thing is happening to revive you, the enemy will take note. And so we see it happening here. The more effective the ministry, the more vicious the enemy. You know, as I was studying this passage, what came to my mind was the book of Nehemiah. We find five different, or excuse me, six different stages in the book of Nehemiah whereby the enemy seeks to somehow overcome and defeat him from the plan that God has given him to revive the stones of Jerusalem. We find, first of all, it causes them grief in chapter 2. Then we find laughing and mockter, mocking in uh, chapter 2, verse 19. But when that's not effective, and many times you'll find people laugh at you and scorn you. But if you get past that, then suddenly we find in chapter 4 there's wrath and indignation. Then we find threats of killing and fighting in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Then we find subtlety when they manage to get the wall armed with men who are there watching, some with swords and others in their hand with trowels and some with trumpets. And then we find the temptation to compromise. Oh, that doesn't seem so bad, and that's in chapter 6. We find the people of God have a will to work. They work together. They build the wall in just a little over 50 days, less than two months. A massive project, but they worked together. They knew their enemy. They knew what the enemy was doing, and they refused to stop the work. Stephen is here. He has been through some of those battles. He has been disputing with these five different groups. He has no doubt had the same type of approach for Satan uses it consistently against God's people, the same type of approach against him that was used against Nehemiah. The second thing that we notice about the enemy is they frequently appear in the guise of religious friends. Even in Nehemiah, they're offering to help rebuild, and the same in Ezra. And they are soundly rejected and become much more bitter enemies when they are rejected. That is also a level of compromise that we must always avoid. How often the church goes to the world to get its financing. Friends, that is a very dangerous step to take. It's a dangerous step for the individual Christian. It is certainly a dangerous step for a church. Many years ago, I pastored a church in North Jersey that in its earlier days had gone to the world for its financing. When I came there, they were struggling deep in debt. And so I told them we were going to have a sinking fund. We were going to seek to get rid of our debt as quickly as possible and pay it off. And so they began to save for the debt retirement of that church. And you know, in the grace of God, <clears throat> he did a marvelous thing. Just as we had reached about 50% of what it would take to retire the debt of the church itself, you remember when the interest rates that were being paid on your savings and money market funds went up to 18, 20, 21 percent? Right about that time, the interest rates were rising to those levels. And the bank was crying about all these loans that it had out there at five and a half percent. And they came to us and offered us if we would make a payoff. So they could get that money back and then put it in and get 18% if we'd make a payoff for this minimal amount. They would let us free with the rest of that loan. We took them up on it. The church became debt free, but we still had one other mortgage on our missionary residence, which was right next door to the church. It was held by a man who was a judge. He had, over the years, hoped that he would get that property. And he would not let us pay it off at a reduced rate. He figured that sometime that bubble would burst and things would come back down again. And he was still hoping that we wouldn't be able to make our mortgage payments on the missions house. God, in his mercy, provided the funding 
so that we paid him off. We paid him off in full and we paid him off about 10 years early. He got the full amount, including principal and interest, that he would have gotten over the next 10 years. And he was disappointed, even though he could take it and invest it at those rates. Because his goal was to take and destroy the church. It's dangerous, folks, when we go to the world for our help. And both Ezra and Nehemiah understood that in the building of the temple and in the building of the walls of the city of Jerusalem. They refused that offer of help which came in the guise of religious friends. The next thing that we learn here is effective victories over the enemy will cause the enemy to change tactics rather than to admit the truth. Here they could not answer Stephen. Stephen was absolutely right in what he was proclaiming, but they would not have it. It was an act of willful rejection of the truth. When you come into contact with people like that, you will always run into the temptation to either walk away from them or to say bad things to them. Like, you are an idiot. We don't see Stephen doing any of that here. You know, oftentimes, um, you'll run into somebody who will say, uh, well, I'm not really an atheist, I'm just an agnostic. And so the question you ask them is, well, are you an ordinary agnostic or are you an ornery agnostic that will draw them into conversation you see the ordinary agnostic is someone who says I don't know and so you say well then I'll be happy to help you learn I will show you the truth and then you can make a decision as to whether or not you want to trust Christ the ordinary agnostic says I don't know and I don't want to know the truth. We have ornery people here. Not ordinary people. We have ornery people in this passage. They do not want to know the truth. You see, men who do not live by the truth will not use the truth to gain victory. They will use lies. And that's what we see in our passage here tonight. You see, men who serve the enemy, Satan, are normally cowards and they use other people to do their dirty work. That's what happens here. The Sanhedrin doesn't want to get their hands dirty. They do have spies out there who uh, have listened in. They themselves have listened in to Stephen's preaching. But uh, since they're going to be sitting to judge this case, and since they've already come to the conclusion that they want to reach, they've got to get somebody else out there to make up some lies, or they give them the lies to speak concerning Stephen and what he has said. That's the position of a coward, someone who will not face on, face you. Because they know that what you say is true and what they are about to say is a lie. Something else that is very interesting, and you see this in the trial of Jesus as well here as the trial of Stephen, and in other trials throughout the book of Acts, as such as we've seen already with the apostles earlier in chapters 4 and 5, is that when people are serving Satan, they will use a righteous sounding cause to gain their end. That's true in the trial of Christ. We'll look at that in a few moments. It's true in the trials that we see of Peter and John in the preceding chapters here. They will use a righteous sounding cause to gain their end. And men who serve the enemy will seek to follow the letter of the law while violating all of the ethical and moral standards of the law. For example, here we have the letter of the law because we have multiple witnesses. The Old Testament required that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. We find the Apostle Paul repeats that for us a number of times in the New Testament. Two or three witnesses had to get together. They had to say the same thing. They had to agree on exactly all the key points when they were bearing testimony against someone else. Yes, they are keeping the letter of the law, but their content is a lie. You see, Satan, who is the father of lies, John chapter 8, verse 44, he's a liar and the father of it. Satan doesn't mind putting in all the false content as long as we keep the decorative trim in place. 
It's like having a frame, and in that frame is a Michelangelo painting, and the devil comes along and he says, well, <clears throat> we're going to put in a crayon sketch by a fourth grader and steal the Michelangelo, but we'll leave the label on the bottom that says Michelangelo. That's what's happening here. It's the same beautiful frame. It's the same label on the bottom, but inside the frame is a picture by a fourth grader. We find the same thing took place over in 1 Kings chapter 21. Now, these are Jewish people. These are people who would have known their Old Testament. These are people who would have not only been taught the Old Testament in their various synagogue schools, but would have had to have known all of these Old Testament narratives. However, instead of learning the point of the narrative, which is it doesn't pay to sin, they thought to themselves, you know, I remember something that I read about Ahab and Jezebel and a man by the name of Naboth. I remember when the rabbi was telling us that story, and that was really interesting, the way that they got Naboth stoned. Over here in 1 Kings chapter 21, we find that Naboth has a vineyard close to the palace where Ahab, the king of Samaria, is living. And Ahab wants that vineyard, and he offers him money for it, and he says no. And so he offers to give him a better vineyard, and he says no. And Ahab goes to his house and begins to pout. So Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Thus thou now govern the kingdom of Israel. Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. We have everything official. Everything official, exactly like it's supposed to be with inside its borders. And sealed them and sent the letters unto it, uh, the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, now here's the content. Proclaim a fast. Oh, what a righteous and holy and religious thing to do, for we are a holy people and we serve the living God. And set Naboth on high among the people. And we're going to follow the rules. We're going to get two witnesses here. Set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Now I want you to pay attention here, because we're going to see the same kind of accusations that are brought against Stephen. Thou didst blaspheme God and the king. And then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were in the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. Here is collusion among the people who will act as the judges. And they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and they sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people. This is a public trial. We're going to see that there's things going on publicly, and the devil always wants to get public opinion in favor of whatever evil thing he's going to do. They brought him before the people, and in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he should die. So Jezebel sends a little note off to Ahab, says, well, okay, vineyard is yours. Ahab is or, uh, Naboth is dead. And of course, after he goes to take the vineyard, Elijah the Tishbite comes, meets him in the vineyard, and tells him that the dogs are going to lick up his blood. Not a pretty picture. These people didn't seem to understand the end of that story. But we find them doing precisely the same thing. They're following the letter of the law while filling the content with absolute lies. And then, as we mentioned a moment ago, the enemy will always seek to gain popular support and popular opinion from those who are ignorant of the truth. 
You know, we see the same thing over in Acts chapter 13. We'll flip over there just for a moment. Uh, this is consistent in the way that Satan works when he attacks God's people, when he attacks those who are leaders in the body of Christ. Acts chapter 13, and down in verse 15. But the Jews stirred up, who? The devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. You see, you see, Satan wants to get public opinion behind his position for doing evil. He will lie to get that popular support. Sorry, <laughs> we haven't put the we have some anti-popping devices on the new equipment, <laughs> but we haven't learned how to use them yet. <clears throat> Satan will always try to get public opinion behind his evil deeds. They stirred up who? The devout and honorable women. These were people who did not know the facts. The enemy will raise up multiple false charges for two reasons. You see, we've got four false charges that are listed for us here. And so there are multiple false charges. And I think there are two reasons why he does it. Number one, if one charge doesn't stick because it, cannot, it can somehow be disproved, then there are other charges still available. And number two, the average man, and listen, we're all like this, the average man automatically assumes that something must be true if many, many bad things are said about a particular individual. Isn't it like that? You hear from someone that so-and-so has done such and such. And then that particular piece of gossip floats through to someone else and they say, oh yes, I heard that too, but you know, I also heard that he did such and such. And you're talking along with somebody else and in the church, and they'll say, you know, I know for a fact that somebody did this, number one, this, number two, and this, number three. And pretty soon you begin to hear lots of different rumors, none of which have been actually substantiated, but you begin to feel in your mind that there is something tacky about that person. We're all prone to that. And so we have four charges here because the average person will normally think that something must be true if that many things are being said against a particular person. Now, let's look at those four charges that are made here. The first two charges are what are used to bring the case to trial. At trial, the last two are added to nail the case shut. We find the first two are he blasphemed Moses and he blasphemed God. By the way, notice which of those comes first in the order of the charges. You see, Judaism by this point had become, and Christ points that out, of course, in the Gospels, very, very man-focused, not really God-focused. He blasphemed Moses. If you do any reading on um, missions in Muslim countries, you know that there are a number of people right now sitting on a Muslim death row because they blasphemed the prophet. Oh, yes, uh, blaspheme Allah too, but the, they've blasphemed Muhammad because they said something about Muhammad that wasn't just quite, and I can't use the term kosher, but <laughs> not quite right. They've blasphemed, Mo he blasphemed Moses. He blasphemed God. Then we look at the second set of charges. After they catch him, it says, he blasphemed the temple. That is, he blasphemed against this holy place. They're talking about the temple. He blasphemed the temple. He blasphemed the law. Again, notice which comes first. The temple. Our Lord Jesus Christ dealt with that issue during his ministry. You know, he was talking about the sacrifices and the gold and the offerings that were on the altar and... Oh, how these people put buildings ahead of God. Dear friends, we must be careful that we not do the same thing. Blasphemy against the temple, and then blasphemy against the law. Notice also that at this point they become even bolder. They intensify their false accusations as he ceaseth not to speak. It's like every time Stephen opened his mouth, his rattle mouth always said some kind of a blasphemy against Moses, God, the temple, or the law. He ceases not to speak. It's like he wasn't preaching anything else. He's only preaching four forms of blasphemy. Now, do you think that's the case with Stephen? I mean, if you read Acts chapter 7, 
He's preaching a sermon. You don't see any blasphemy there. Blasphemy, technically, is when a creature seeks to take upon himself prerogatives that belong only to God. But as you look at this situation here, it's like making a, a fourfold repetitive action through one particular incident. It's like saying this man has been arrested for daily drunken disorderly conduct. And we're also accusing him of drunk driving. And we're also accusing him of drunken spousal abuse. And we're also accusing him of drunken resisting arrest. But there's something that ties them all together. What is it? Alcohol. Here we have Moses, we have God, we have the temple and we have the law. But there's one thing that ties them all together. And it's the charge of blasphemy because they know that that is a capital crime. They can't accuse him of murder. They have no dead body to prove. They can't accuse him of, you know, um, grand larceny because they have no money to show on anybody who was stolen. They have to accuse him of something that is intangible whereby other people will have a very difficult time disproving it. They put themselves out on the line where they say he ceaseth not to speak, but at this point who's going to come forward to defend Stephen? It's a very serious crime that they've accused him of. Notice something else. They did not, when they say he blasphemed Moses, blasphemed God, blasphemed the temple, and blasphemed the law, the evidence that they offer is twofold evidence which is derived from those two pieces of evidence. It's not actually what he said. They give two pieces of evidence. They claim to have heard him say that Jesus would destroy the temple. So that results in their derivative, he blasphemed the temple, and therefore, because he blasphemed the temple, he blasphemed God. They only give two pieces of evidence. That's the one that relates to the temple and to God. Then, they claim to have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth would change the customs delivered by Moses. Therefore, they conclude, he must be blaspheming the law, and if he is blaspheming the law, he is blaspheming Moses. Do you see how they start with something is very weak evidence, and they turn it into a quadruple charge that is very concrete, but not true. They never heard him say, Cursed be Moses or cursed be God, or cursed be the temple, or cursed be the law. Yet they say he's blasphemed all four cases. They never heard him say that. What they heard him say, and this is what they give as evidence, that Jesus would destroy the temple, and that Jesus would change the customs delivered to Moses. Something else very, very interesting as we look at this, and we don't have time to look at all the passages in the New Testament where this word occurs, but customs is a very general term. Ethos. It's a very vague accusation when they get to the customs delivered by Moses, and thus very hard to prove false their witness. Did you notice they didn't say that he was trying to change some specific customs, and here they are, one, two, three, four, five. They didn't say he's changing the customs required by the law, such as the Ten Commandments. This word means habits, or customary things, or manner of doing things. Things not only prescribed by law, but things prescribed by habit. Let me give you an illustration. Such as coming into Bible Presbyterian Church as a new pastor four years ago, and deciding that we are no longer going to sing the doxology. We're going to rearrange the service and take the offering last. We're going to have the sermon first on the list, so that anybody who's late doesn't get to hear the sermon. Now, you know, that would cause a little trouble here. That would cause some stirring of the waters. That's the word that's used. In other words, what are they defending? And they are doing two things by defending this. Or suppose we decided we would not have a singspiration in the evening service for the first part of the service. <laughs> Folks, I don't, I'm not interested in changing the customs. But that's what they're accusing him of. 
And in doing that, they are doing two things. Number one, rather than making a formal charge or breaking a specific law, they've used a bait and switch tactic here. And they have also placed their additions to the law, the 639 rules that comprise what the Jews call the hedge about the law, under Mosaic authority. Those were not things that Moses required, such as for today, Orthodox Jews in Mea Sharim, which is a section of Jerusalem, on the Sabbath day, you will see them out and about, the men wearing their dark, long coats and their fuzzy black hats and dark trousers with tennis shoes. Because you see, the law of Moses said that you're not supposed to light a fire on the Sabbath. And so they have reasoned that because heels of shoes are put on with nails and stones are on the ground, you may, as you walk along, have a nail that is exposed. It hits a piece of rock that is flint. It causes a spark, and therefore you have broken the law. The hedge about the law. The customs that they say were delivered to us by Moses. Dear people, be careful not to put the rules of man on the same level as the law of God. They've made a bait and switch so that they can make a more forceful argument against what Stephen has said. At the end of his speech, of course, they're going to stone him to death on the basis of what he says at the end of his speech. But the way they've gotten him to the trial is by a lie. You know, that's the same kind of accusations that they brought against Christ when they came to Pilate. They didn't care what the truth was. And so Pilate says, okay, what are you accusing him of? What is he guilty of? And John 18.30 says, they answered and said unto him, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. You know, just give us the decision, put him to death. Folks, pagans cheat to win. Pagans lie to win. Pagans don't want the truth known, because then they lose. The same charges are brought against our Lord Jesus Christ. As he is standing before the Sanhedrin, they said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. That's Matthew 26, 61. We find another variation on that testimony in Mark 14, 58. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. And as the Gospels point out, all these different ones that came to accuse him, their testimony did not agree. You see, they had to be precise and accurate, and here are the Jews trying to follow the petty, legalistic borders of the law and ignoring the weighty matters of the law. Did you notice the difference between those? One of them talks about a temple made with hands, and another made without hands, and one, the temple of God. Well, they had some things that were similar, but they weren't identical. What did Jesus actually say? We know what Jesus actually said because John tells us that in John chapter 219. Jesus answered them and said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That's what he actually said. John says that's what he actually said. Was that exactly the same thing that is quoted for us up here in Matthew 26, 61? Or in Mark chapter 14, 58, where we find false witnesses speaking? No, it was not. And if you're in a court of law, you have to be very precise about what you say. And the evidence to convict a criminal has to be very precise. It can't be sort of fuzzy. As I was looking through that, another passage came to mind. And I thought, isn't this interesting? Because again, we have a statement about the temple of God. It's in 1 Corinthians 3.17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall, him shall God destroy... For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Defiling your body, 
which is the residence of the Holy Spirit, comes under the judgment of God. Oh, the Jews were so worried about that stone building. Jesus, as John explains, was speaking about the body of his temple, which would be destroyed, killed, and then would rise from the dead three days later. And yet they could not understand that because they were focused on material things. How often do we fail to understand what God is communicating to us because we are so focused on material things? How often do we violate that which God has told us to do or not to do because we do not understand things that are truly holy. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It's a painful passage as we look through it, because we find here the same thing that Christians throughout the centuries have experienced. I've only heard a few of the different wars that go on in the church. I do not want to hear all the rest of them. I know of accusations back and forth between various people over the many years that this church has been in existence. I think not only destroying or defiling the temple of God, which is our bodies, but defiling the body of Christ, which is the church, not the buildings, but the people, has some serious repercussions. Stephen stands to answer the charges in verse 15. And it's interesting that it wasn't just some that sat in the council that saw this. It says all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him. This was like a pack of wolves surrounding the man with the torch. The eyes of every wolf are focused on the man. They want him for lunch. But the wolves are held back because there is something that is glowing there that they fear. God allowed Stephen the opportunity to answer the charges, to answer them fully, and to become the first martyr. That opened the door for widespread persecution. We see that in the following chapters. But God had a purpose in that because, if you will recall, our Lord Jesus Christ had given a commission to the disciples before he ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, You shall be my witnesses. Where are you going to go? Jerusalem? Judea? Samaria? Uttermost parts of the earth. What did they do? It's the temptation that goes all the way back to Babylon. You know, the people said, We don't want to be scattered over the face of the earth. We're going to sit here and build a city. God came down, confused their languages, and made them break up. God had given a commission to the early disciples, and it is a commission that continues today. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. They had stayed at Jerusalem. But God's purpose and God's plan was to carry the message of the gospel to the far reaches of the earth. And amazing the way God used to do it. The very finest deacon of the church in Jerusalem is brought to trial and put 
to death. And it opens the door for the persecution that spreads the church and thus spreads the gospel. Dear people, if we are not about the business which God has called us to do, we may very well expect the same things that happened to the church in Jerusalem. And all, not just some of his enemies, all of his enemies looking steadfastly on him, there was nobody falling asleep at this trial. There was nobody busy reading a magazine or book or some kind of a newspaper. There was nobody there who was bored with the trial. They were all paying very close attention to him because they wanted, as they did with Jesus, they wanted to catch him in his words. You and I are on examination every day. You and I are on examination every time we open our mouths in the presence of an unbeliever who knows that we are a Christian. Every day you and I are on trial by a watching world as to what we will say about our Lord Jesus Christ and whether that will be reflected in the way we live and the radiance of our countenance as we stand before them. They saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. The majestic, angelic beings that we cannot see and someday will see. Angels are in this place. They are watching us as we worship. They desire to look into those things, Peter tells us, which were prophesied and to look into how Christ is demonstrating his grace in the church. Oh, that we would always be aware that we are a watched audience. We look at the preacher, angels are looking at us. Jesus is looking at us. We're surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, the heroes of faith who have gone before us, Hebrews 11. How will we run our race? With fear? With the beautiful, quiet confidence of a man who, looking into heaven, knew that he was about to die? Someday we will give an account. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for the things that you have directed our thoughts to this evening. We thank you for Stephen and for his testimony and for the fact that it is recorded for us in the Holy Word of God that we might learn, that we might understand, that we might know what it means to be a good witness, martyria, from which we get our word martyr. For Stephen here is a witness and he is a martyr. One who unapologetically stands for his faith in the face of those who surround him and whom he knows will put him to death. He never falters. He's a man of faith, and he is a faithful man. Father, thank you once again for your word. We pray that you will take it and bless it to our hearts, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.